Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the organizer to give me this opportunity to present our work about the game of iron. My name is Ju Yuan Li from the Center of Peking University, the quantitative biology. So mostly I'm interested in how life organizes themselves. And for me, one of the interesting things is that in the microbial community, that meal we know a lot and knows very little simultaneously. On one hand, we have millions of sequences about all different microbes, and this number is still expanding. But meanwhile, because only a very, very tiny fraction of microbes is experimentable in the lab. So about, I think, less than 100%. So our understanding about what these genes are doing, and more importantly, how they form these ecologic interactions are still lacking. So our lab is interested in to use computational methods to map from the sequence, what we know a lot, to the function and ecology, which we know a little bit. But of course, we know the microbial community are so complex. So I still think I'm a physicist, so we like to find a simple cutting point. And we think, for me, the simple cutting point is a competition for iron. Because ever since the great oxygen event about 2.5 billion years ago, the concentration of bioavailable iron is extremely low, scale lower than what's required for the microbial growth. Iron is crucial for us and for microbes for replication respiration. Basically, they need iron, but the bioavailable iron is such a low concentration that they need to find a solution. So secreting siderophil is a major solution for all, almost for all microbes to scavenge iron. So therefore, I'm going to repeat these terms again, again in the following of the talks. They are a class of diverse small molecules that have high binding affinity with ions. They are diverse in structures and ability to, to bind ion. For example, this one is the most amazing one. It has the highest known binding affinity with ion. You can see its number. It is capable of extracting ion even from the aerosol. And there's something else. And al almost every microbes have at least one set therefore producing or receiving pathway. They work in this way. Set therefore is produced by microbes and then released to the environment. Then it becomes a public good. That it binds with iron with its high affinity, now forms the iron set therefore complex, then taken back by receptors. Yeah, we are also interested in receptors. These receptors recognize set therefore and then intake it back to a cell so the cell can get this valuable iron. So as we said, almost these related pathways exist in almost all microbes and fungus and even some plants. So what is a system we can choose? This is a specific system, the Pseudomonas genus. It is in, exists in a wide range of habitats. So it have, provides sufficient diversity for us to extract rules. For example, if someone get a nasty non-infection, it is probably due to one of them. And the siderophore, it produces, yeah, almost each type of microbes have their own characteristic siderophores. And the siderophore made by these pseudomonas is termed povidin. And then it get produced by some very funny enzyme. It's one of the largest enzymes in the microbial community, in the microbes. It's highly costly, but it's used to synthesize this siderophore. Then it gets released to the environment, bind iron from complex, then get recognized and taken back by the cell, by the receptor, FPVA. So here's the outline of this story. So first, I start to turn into mathemat by mathematician to extract sequence information about the ion scavenging machinery in pseudomonas. And second, using coevolution information, we reconstruct how they interact by ion. And then comes the, my favorite part, that is network modeling about the ecology, evolution, games of cooperation, and cheating. So as a first step of investigation, we need to annotate this huge, diverse microbes, their genomes, to find out where are the sensitive genes that make siderophil povidin, and where are the receptors, the genes code for receptors that intake them. 
So combined with some machine learning techniques and with some human intelligence, I think we did a good job. First, we can annotate the genes that produce Cidervo, and Cidervo is highly diverse. So based on this sequence, we play some tricks and we can predict what is the chemical structure of the Cidervo, the small molecules they produce with almost nearly 100% accuracy. The previous algorithms, almost about 50% or 60% of accuracy. So we improved the accuracy a lot. We basically have the sequence to chemical structure mapping. Then for the receptors, we also find some new ways of annotating the side of receptors, which is much more accurate than previous method. So in total, this is what we get. A hugely diverse universe of the ion scavenging machinery in Pseudomonas. So here's the outside circle are different, the poverty inside the force. Different colors means what is the amino acid you use to form these small molecules of the side force. You can see they are kind of conserved in the first several and get diverged as it move on to some next and next amino acid that form this side of So we found 108 unique structures in terms of what kind of amino acids you use to build the site therefore. And among them, 37 are reported. So about 100 of them are new, but we get our collaborators to have some of them measured and it is almost exactly a structure. And also we annotated their receptors and we found their sequence. Although all of them are FPVAs, the receptor that takes the poverty, their sequence also become a different. And if you do some clustering, their sequence similarity reveals about 90, 90 groups that clusters, and only three of them has been reported. So first, we have this overview of the ion scavenging machineries. But what we're interested in still is how they interact with each other, how they interact by ion. So that's what we do. Reconstruction ion interaction network, first by just counting. This is still the phylogeny of about 2,000 strings. And they from plants, from soil, and from these nasty human microbes. And you can see that if you just count here in purple, how many sensitivities are there? Some of them have one, some of them have none. It's a black region. And if you count how many receptors, the FPVA receptor that eat this cytorophor, the number varies a lot. Some of them has a lot, and some of them has probably only one. So the, we find that there are three type of strategies, uh, the ion strategies that all these 2000 pseudomonas string use. The first, what we call nickname is honest string. They have one sensitase and exactly one receptors. So we call them single receptor producers. They produce one, they eat one. And there are some of the classical cheaters. They don't produce, they just don't have any sensitivity in the whole genome. We cannot find them in any ways, but they have receptors. So they're ready to eat the siderophore from the others because siderophore is so expensive to make. And about 800 of them, they are multi receptor producers. They synthesize one siderophore, they have one sensitized genes, but they have multiple copies of receptors in their genomes. So why do they need more than one receptor? Because bacteria has been known to have compact genomes. They don't keep things they don't use. Probably because, as we mentioned earlier, there are multiple types of the providence and multiple types of the receptors. So there are some known structures, about three of them, subtypes of the providence, that they are similar in their chemical structures with some of the difference. So this, each of them, can be recognized by one subtype of the FPVAs. So it's more like kind of like a lock and the key relationship. One lock can be opened by one key. For example, if you are a green subtype of Cytorophore, you can only be uptaken by the green subtype of the receptor, but not the blue subtype of the receptor. This one cannot be recognized. So at least, so, as we find not only three subtypes, but many different, as we said, 108 different structures, they force into about 90 groups of receptors. 
So do we still in this lock and key relationship for the hugely diverse poverty? So first the answer is yes, but at least in the sensitization receptors in this single receptor producers, this honest receptor, the honest producer that only have one sensitase and one receptors. Here is a hierarchical clustering of the sequence distance of this about 900 different single receptor producers. Here, the color indicates that how similar the sequence are. The green, uh, this blue region means their sequence are highly similar. And the yellow region means they're not similar at all. So we use a sequence distance, sequence similarity of the receptor to perform hierarchical clustering. And we find first, all these things with black text around is the three, among the three subtypes that already know. They form clear clusters. And if you, if you use the same order to sort the phylogeny, they kind of follow it, but not exactly. They have many mismatches, but it matches extremely well with their sensitivities. Because in these single receptor producers, there's exactly one-to-one -one relationship between a sensitivity and receptor. And because as we mentioned, this sensitivity is extremely expensive. So it does not make sense if they produce something they cannot recognize. So we can see this is a clear sign of coevolution. Here is the key and here's the lock. This block of key can only open the lock here in this block, but not this block. It makes sense if they co evolve. But we know there are single receptor producers, but there are also a large number of multi receptor producers. Can we identify all these lock and key pairs between the sensitivities that makes the siderophore and the receptors that eat, recognize, and uptake the siderophore? So again, we use coevolution. I'm going to ignore all these technical details, mathematics details, and just show the workflow. The most challenging part is to pair the sensitase with the self-receptor. What we term self-receptor is in the multi-receptor producer. The receptor that recognizes the sensitase, the poverty made by its own sensitase, and uptake it, and the rest of them are what we call the cheating receptors. They are ready to take the siderophore made by the other sub subtypes, made by other strings. So using some coevolution method, we think the right pairs is the one that maximizes the coevolution strength, and then you can apply some unsupervised learning. Then to pair the sensitivities with receptors in the two sequence space. So for example, we think the sensitivities here can be recognized by receptors here. Then by sequence similarity, we can assign these unpaired receptors to each of these groups. Then we can know, predict from the genomes, which type, which subtype, here shown by color, of siderophore one string make, and which subtypes of siderophores one string could eat. So by the, using siderophores and this intermediator, we can infer how they interact with each other and trying to use some dyna network dynamic models to understand how they evolve. Because I think we have limited in time and I'm happy to discuss more details about how these algorithms make, but here is what we get after this pairing algorithm. Not three subtypes of lock and key, we get about 40 and 50 different subtypes of lock and key. Here's the receptors in their sequence space by their similarities, and here is the sensitivities by their similarities. Each of the arrows links a group of sensitivities and receptors together, then we have to validate it experimentally because everything here are just predictions from the genomes. So we have some satisfactory validation by our lab, one of the postdocs who can do experiment, I cannot do experiment, but the postdoc can, and our collaborators. We found that the accuracy of whether two strings can have the eye interaction or not, and whether it's positive or negative, is among 90% of accuracy. Still, we have about 10% of them we predicted not so correctly, but that, I think, may give us confidence. If it works for about 50 strings, it probably works for 2,000 strings. So we apply the same method to this whole 2,000 strings, and here's a network we see. We 
just classify the networks by the habitat because strains from different habitats probably don't interact with each other. And you can see from soil to plants to water to human, the diversity of the network actually decreased. But these human pathogens, they get mostly sequenced. Most of the sequence actually of the 2000, a large portion of them come from this human pathogen, but they have the least diversity. And you can see the single receptor producers, they have the highest fraction in human, but this multi-receptor producer and these cheaters, they don't have pretty they don't produce, so therefore, they, own, they are mostly existing soil and water. Here is how you see the network. Usually one type of set therefore, characterized by color, can be uptake by many different strings. Some of them make it, some of them don't make it. So here, the Siderophore network is fun for me because first, it's always about a game of cooperation and cheating. So the cheater always want to cheat, but it cannot cheat if it does not have the right type of receptors. So it's a constant mutation and chasing process. And also because of the involvement of this multi-receptor produ producer, it able to produce but also ready to cheat. It produced one, but cheat on many. I think it might bring something interesting to the model. So first we're trying to understand in this pseudomonas system, how does this diversity generate it? So first we get some of these agent-based metapopulation model just to incorporate mutation, random pooling. So we pool a, about, I think, two to five strings out of the, 200, 2,000 strings and let them compete and have horizontal gene transfer and have mutation and see what will happen if we evolve. First, we can mimic what we're observing in this prediction that is the basic requirement for model. And more importantly is that if we knock out horizontal gene transfer in this model, that it means you just block the horizontal gene transfer, you find that it cannot diverge as fast as we observed. So horizontal gene transfer makes this system to diverge and have more diversification than what's expected without it. And we can see there are two forces shaping the community. Why is that for receptors? You want it to be the majority of the receptors. It recognizes the sensitivities that is utilized by as many strings as possible, then you can just exploit it. But for sensitase, if you are strained with some sensitase, you want it to be the minor sensitase. It can be recognized by as little of this, as less of the strings in the community, that is better. So these two forces shaping the community and drive the diversification and drive the creation of new siderophores. Another fun thing about this siderophore network is that it's a demonstration of how microbes actively expand the resource dimension of its local habitat. So microbes are constrained by the local environment. They need to eat, they need to take the oxygen, need to take carbon that consumes this resource and get limited. But meanwhile, they use a considerable amount of the resource to make the secondary metabolites, including antibiotics, including inside therefore to shape their chemical environment and makes it more diverse. So it's like that it gets many of the fun things. Life always find a way. And so if we perform theoretical biology like this one, we think we have the assumption that the mice want to get the chase, get the cheese, and it will go the shortest path. We set a constraint and optimize the path and make some assumption it will walk in some shortest path. And here's how the real life goes. It just finds that there is a Z axis. So why resource dimension is so important for microbe communities? Because it determines the upper bound of coexistence. It has been known for a long time, about half a century, that you can theoretically prove, mathematically prove, that the upper bound of numbers of species cannot exceed the number of resources, the types of resources in this community. It causes a long contradiction that people don't understand because we only have, we can count carbon, nitrogen, phosphates, oxygen. These are the number of resources that limit microbes, but we see a huge diversity. So microbes have some ways to increase the number of resource dimensional habitats, 
One possibility is by cross-feeding. And another possibility is that you use side It's not. It is the public good for these who have the corresponding receptors. But it's also something to private the ion to make the ion unacceptable to these who don't have that receptor. So it's not only the resource consumer model that has been used by theoretical ecology for a long time, it's a resource partition model, where the resource produced by microbes actively partition the real resource, the ion, into different sectors that is acceptable to these who have the corresponding receptors. So we found something interesting theoretically, that the stability criteria of this model, resource competition model, changes if it becomes resource partition model. That is, when only one sign of the equation changes, that when you not only intake resources, but also produce resources. Um, again, I think I'm going to ignore most of the details and you can find it a preprint here. And it just says There's that- about five minutes left. Yes. So we can write down some equations about how microbes produce siderophore and get the iron back, but partition it to private siderophore and public siderophore. Once you have this simplest ways of partition, you find that cheat and cooperators, not the full cooperator, but the partial cooperator, they can coexist. Not only they can coexist stably, they can coexist in an oscillatory way. When we see it, we felt amazed because in the classical model, where only things compete for resources, we can prove mathematically that it cannot oscillate with only two species. At least three species is required to produce oscillation and more interesting dynamics. But we can prove, again, with one change of the size of the resource consumption. You not only cons consume, but also you produce resource. You have the stability criteria changes, and the system suddenly become more dynamic if you add more species. And here is some of the general form of the resource competition model that change, changes into resource partition model. You have some supply of resource and the microbes actively using some of the siderophil things, or it can use antibiotics or other ways to partition this resource into different colorful sectors, different subtypes. Then it can be uptaken by the one have the corresponding type of receptors. We found that not only the stability criteria changes, but more importantly, it is important, it is crucial to cheat, not only to collaborate to produce, but also important to cheat. So for a simple, another resource partition model that involves two species, two types of siderophore, the purple and yellow one, and two types, each one are a multi-receptor producer. They produce one, but they eat two. Then you can prove mathematically again that the stability criteria for stable coexistence is that both of them invest more than on their cheating receptor, but not the receptor that recognizes its own siderophore. And if you add it into more species, you involve more species and more siderophores, something not so monotonic happen. Here is a number of cheating edges, cheating receptors in the community comparing to the number of siderophores. And you can see that the number of coexisting species just increase in some right level of the cheating and then decreases. So of course you cannot cheat too much, but also it's good to, for everyone to have some, some cheating, to have a diverse community. And when you change it, of course it's mathematic model, but looks fun. And when you change the ratio of resource you invest on the cheating edges here, you can see the community changes from only several species dominant into more species, and in some way it starts to oscillate. This is still ongoing that we are trying to understand why they start to have this oscillatory dynamics and whether this cheating influence the community diversity. So this is still ongoing. Microbes are so fun, and for siderophore, we only investigated the Pseudomonas genus. But almost all microbes have this machinery, and it's shared cross species. Here is one of the pathogens, another non pathogen, Klebsia, that's getting more and more antibiotic resistant. And if you check its genome, it's very nasty bacteria. It has not only one, it has four 
if for the high wireless one, for sensitives for different type of siderophores. And this one is also produced by the plague that cause an even more deadly disease. And also it has about 20 different receptors, ready to eat 20 different type of receptors, including this from, from the enterobacteria, this, for example, E. coli, and even someone from fungus. They eat ready to eat siderophores from fungus. So what we are trying to do now is that we're trying to build an eye interaction network between different microbes still using this co-evolution flow. So in the summary, that first we turn into bioinformaticians trying to extract sequence features in the eye scavenging machinery in Pseudomonas. Then using co-evolution method, we try to find all pair and pairs of lock and key relationship to understand what kind of siderophore it produce and what kind of siderophore it take to form this eye interaction network. Then we find that mathematically, this kind of network is pretty fun. So that's it. And I'd like to thank the organizer and thanks for the Peking University for the support. And here as a student, like Xiao Hua, the one who is here, to the postdoc mostly do the job and Yuan Zhe for performing this analysis on sequences. So thanks very much. Question. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, great talk. Um, so I'll, I, I'll start us off with a question. We have a few minutes. Um, does the physical environment where this producing and consuming of siderophores is occurring, um, does that matter, do you think? Does it change the dynamics, like that the environment could be so different? Yeah, when you say physical environment, it means the temperature, pH, Osmotic stress? Yeah, the, the, so the temperature of the pH, and I imagine if it's happening in different systems like he, like the human gut or somewhere else, like it could be in a mm -hmm. film or it might be like maybe the microbes are just floating around in water. Um, do, do you think that makes a difference? Extremely, extremely important that the physics environment, many times when you are in a lab, you just keep it constant. But in a real, as you said, gut microbes, temperature influence the fitness, means which one can grow fastest. So the one who did not have a disadvantage at one temperature may get better in the gut. And also the whether it's like the diffusion factor of the siderophore makes a huge impact on how likely it's like to share. So it already has been by some of our collaborators, they found that the diffusion, usually microbes in a highly diffusible environment does not want to produce siderophores. They know they are going to lose their public good. And when they are more localized, like in soil, they're more likely to produce it. So I see. Wow, that's very to... interesting, actually. I think Cornelia has, has a question. Do you, would you like to ask your question um, out loud? Yeah, I can, I can just uh, read it again. Yeah, so, um, so serial force, when, when they bind iron, and if you supply more iron, uh, then of course, more will also um, end up in the label iron pool and more will also be stored in, in, in ferritin uh, storage proteins, uh, which potentially will also be upregulated as a response to, to, to larger supplies. Uh, so how did you um, consider for that in your model? Yeah, thanks for the question. So currently, well, in model, we assume an iron deficient environment and in experiment, we also deplete the culture with iron. So it's a extremely limited environment, but when there are more ions, so most microbes will downregulate their expression of the siderophores. So they, if they get diffusible iron and they get more like sequest, like in iron rich environment, they stop making this costly siderophore. Is that yeah, but answer your question? But after, like, like after the uptake, not, not, not part of this partitions to, um, like iron storage proteins. So, so usually, I, I would, I would think, um, once you supply, uh, iron, um, then the amount of siderophores that will be produced will go up. But also, iron storage proteins will be upregulated, and also the fraction which ends up in the label iron pool potentially. But, but you have not included these other intracellular compartments in your model to, to some extent. Not yet. And 
So usually for microbes, they are in a iron deficient environment, but yes, when they have too much iron, they will have these other proteins trying to store the iron. So, but currently in our model, we not consider that one. 